Well, hello everybody and welcome to the Human Echoes recap for Channel Zero, The No End House. Episode 3, Beware the Cannibals! Uh, Beware the Cannibals, I'm sure you'll recall, was the phrase that was written on the wall as you enter the No End House, at least as these people entered the No End House in the first room. Or maybe it was the second room. I don't remember. But it was early on, as they were all entering the No End House. It makes me wonder... Like, who wrote that phrase? Is it a warning? Like, in, in the context of the original episode, we're just looking at things through their eyes, and it's just a creepy thing on the wall. But now we have... We know who the cannibals are. We know what the phrase probably means when it talks about the cannibals. So, who gave them that warning? The The house doesn't... Wouldn't seem to have a reason... To, to lay that, you know, in front of them and say, hey guys, watch out, there's some cannibals in here. I know that I, my whole thing is that I get people scared and steal their memories, but watch out for those people who are going to steal your memories. So maybe there's a, like a renegade element within the house, which ties in with some other things that I think are interesting about this episode that we found revealed. Uh, the opening scene is Jules again with the egg. Last week we saw her in the bathtub and there was the egg and it lit up. Here we have a much more graphic depiction of this thing. And we, at the end of last episode, we saw the father thing stealing Margot's memories of her mom. And here this steals Jules's memory of her childhood dog. And the, the visual here is just very unsettling. You have the, these hands pushing through the membrane of this thing. We're calling it the egg because that's the best thing we can call it, but it's not an egg exactly. Um, and it's, it's, it takes her memory. We see this process happen again. We understand this happens throughout the house somehow. Um, and it creates another one of these pomegranate people. I don't know if, if it's like who the pomegranate person that it creates is, if it's just a replica of Jules or if it's her sister. There's some theories going around about her sister and her wanting to forget things we'll get to kind of close to the end of the episode. But it, it creates one of these pomegranate people and it's not like when the father thing created it and it had a mouth to eat it. We see this thing just sort of rolling over this body and the hands kind of try and pushing through and absorbing. It's very creepy and very, very cool. Uh, I'm, I don't, I, I don't hate the theory still that the egg is representative somehow of a pregnancy somewhere in Jules' life, but I don't, I'm not married to that idea either. I am just, I'm open to all possibilities. The other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, pomegranates, like the interior of the thing that Margo's, I'm sorry, yeah, Margo's dad created look like pomegranates. We saw pomegranates being created or being eaten in the first episode uh, by Margot and I looked up the symbology the symbolism of pomegranates and it seems like that they're linked to fertility which is also like orchids are linked to female anatomy fertility that kind of stuff I, I don't know what that means I do, like, knowing about pomegranates and their link to fertility and linking that up with the orchids and knowing what I know about orchids symbolically, I don't know what that tells us about what the No End House is, but it's a thing. You guys can put it in your hopper. Maybe you have an idea of where that's going. Margot wakes up, and she's starting to see the cracks in the house now. Uh, she notices the two bikers go by again. Uh, she has this... Like, one of the rooms in her room is apparently used to be a closet, and now it's this weird, twisted, interdimensional hallway that she closes because it's freaky, right? You'd, like, maybe let's try the other door before we walk down the Lovecraftian twisted dimension hall. But obviously not normal, right? And she sneaks down the hall, and she overhears her dad practicing saying hello margo or good morning margo morning margo morning margo morning margo and it's 
like it's one of those moments that there's a lot of stuff in the show that's not scary right it doesn't it, it, you're not I, I wasn't like horrified oh my goodness he's practicing how to say morning margo but the implications of that the idea that this thing is rehearsing its role to maximize the connection with her is is very interesting because it tells us that the house isn't perfect the house or these things that it creates anyway aren't just omniscient dream beings that can do i mean they can pull from your memories obviously we find out about out, out about in this episode but it they're limited in some scope and we also find out as we go through especially with some of the stuff with jd and as the father thing gets more desperate that these things have some kind of internal life of their own they understand their own nature but they ain't thrilled about the idea of dying once that their purpose was has been fulfilled so just all of these implications as as he's practicing morning margot and she is horrified you know comes up to him sees as he fixes her breakfast again he says that he ate already yeah we know dude she sees the face in the trash and freaks out can't remember exactly who it is but it triggers this awareness that now there's a blank spot in her memory right and i, I it wasn't real subtle but, but the, our theory that they're eating memories here has been 100 percent confirmed and she runs up to her room and again oh man i last week with john carroll lynch playing the dad I talked to you guys about how I wanted him to be real, for lack of a better word. I wanted him to be genuinely a loving, some kind of copy of her father. And you get to the end of the episode and he's eating her memories, right? And so that seems like it just smacked that idea down. But John Carroll Lynch, in his portrayal of this father thing character, has... uh, I'm just in awe. I'm in awe of how much sympathy this guy can make for a a character that is a memory eater created from memories essentially by a monster house. You we can't take any anything he could he says could be a lie. But at the very least, as I mentioned earlier, we can know that he wants to stay alive. And the way that he tries to do this as Jules retreats to her room uh, to get away from him is by using more pieces of the truth, right? And we saw him do this in the previous episode, which is a lot of fun. In the previous episode, he's talking to Jules and he says to Jules, yeah, okay, actually my memory, I don't have it. I probably was created for this scenario, but I want to see how this goes. He uses enough of his memory to try to get into her uh, get around her defenses right because he knows that she's suspect so he says yeah you're right you should be suspicious because i did just get created i don't have memories of the last year so i i'm just gonna let this play out and he try and in also master manipulation here he turns it around on her here he's doing essentially the same thing where he says oh you know what i think that i let you see that because i want i need you to know the reality of who I am. And by the way, I eat stuff that isn't food. And if you could come out and just let me have a bite of your memory, that would be great. I, man, that's what? Again, not like scary. Not in a, a jump scare or like a like building horror music kind of way, but just the fact that this thing is maybe has some of these real emotions maybe doesn't but is definitely willing to use those emotions to get what it wants from margo is so uh, i just get chills i get chills thinking about it i've skipped over some stuff uh so i'm gonna double back a little bit jd the alpha jd the one that the house created has burned his real double uh we see him burning him in a fire pit um and dylan He's the backpack guy, all right? I went and finally learned everybody's names. Uh, he is in the house with his wife, right? The, he, she's the one that he came in with. And 
after last episode where he just barged in and said, I'm your husband. And she's like, no, you're not. He has, and, and this is so twisted too. I, I, mm, I'm just so, I'm, I don't, I'm so excited about this, this imagery because he has zip tied her to a chair. She's clearly horrified, right? And he's showing her these pictures of their weddings, right? And saying, there, here we are, we're happy together. Here we are, happy together. And she is just like losing her mind because this is not what she remembers. And the beautifully perverse thing about this scene is that the house creates these nightmares, right? It creates these doppelgangers to come in and subvert what you want and and get inside your head and take your memories. And yet, Dylan's not a doppelganger, probably. Like real strong possible probability, not a doppelganger. But the house has still found a way to use him as a nightmare for his wife, who is also not a doppelganger. Ah, oh, the irony of that is just beautiful and sickening. I mind blown. Okay, that was just what I was thinking when I watched that scene. I was like, oh, that is so twisted. <sighs> Okay, I'm gonna calm down. <laughs> huh. Margot escapes to her room and we see her trying to escape from the room. She wants to get out. She can't break the windows because this is a weird dream house, although not fully dreamlike because the house can't, apparently can't do just whatever it wants. All right, the father thing has to physically break down the door. He can't teleport through. He has some kind of physical existence and so does this house. But Jules, the only way out is through this closet, weird dimension pocket thing that takes her beautifully edited, by the way. I just a real quick shout out to all the editing in this episode and, and the way that many of these ideas were conveyed. But it takes her into this pool. And I, I forgot to talk about the pool last week when we were recapping the episode. But she went into the pool in her house and it was this basically infinitely deep dark ocean right she could get up to the surface and it was just the pool still but there's something going on with the water here that is not a hundred percent clear it makes me wonder if it's related to the place where the the creations of the house pull the memory golems from i just made the memory golem thing up but whatever the the shapes that they're eating memories out of the like it maybe those two places are linked somehow i don't have a good theory on what the dark water place is but it's it's interesting that we've seen it twice now i don't think that's a coincidence i think that's going to keep playing in and possibly that's going to be the method of escape i wonder if all the pools or all the bodies of water in this place are connected to the same dark water that uh, that's just the theory because we haven't seen but that would make sense to me and she runs and runs and the father thing runs after her he sees that she's escaped and she along the line meets up with Jules and the other guys who have all gotten together now all right JD shows up um, the other guy whose name is Seth learn his name too. have it in my notes uh, they're all JD and Seth and Jules are all together and they see Margot being chased by her dad and Margot runs into this school, which I initially thought, well, this must be just like, you know, a, a memory of Margot's school, right? It's kind of weird looking. It's very distinctive, but you know, it's no end house. You want things to look distinctive. You're not going to have just like a boring cinder block school. So she goes into the school and it, it's, th there's a dreamlike quality to it. The ho the corridors seem impossibly long. I don't know if they, maybe they just actually were that long, you guys. I have no idea, but she's running down these corridors. Her dad runs in after her and she runs into this woman who's speaking Russian and who's babbling, or, I'm sorry, to Margot, she just says shh, shh, over and over again, really loudly. That was just something beautifully creepy about that scene. Gets away from her. And the father thing finds this woman laying on the floor, repeating a phrase over and over in Russian, 
which I did not know, but according to the subreddit on the recap thing that they post over there, the episode discussion, is don't let her in. I don't know if that has to do with Margot in particular and the things that she means to the house, like maybe she's something special more than the other people, or if it's just don't let her into this memory, it's not her memory. But her and Margot, Jules and Margot end up sort of teamed up here. They're hiding from the father thing. Beautiful tense scene as he's like right outside the window as they're hiding behind this desk, right? About to open the door. The boys come in and rattle the, the things and, and chase him off, which is more proof, I think, of the autonomy of these created things, right? Because if they were all working in concert for the house, if they were all in service of the same nightmare, then there's no reason they shouldn't have let the father thing catch Jules and Margot. And we find out at the end of the episode, I ass- and I assume that they're both at this point changed, that these guys are both these creations of the house. And so I- I- I'm forming this idea that these things that are made within the house have, you know, survival instincts and the desire to live, even if they are only crafted from someone else's memory. In the meantime, Dylan, still torturing his own wife, trying to get her to come back to him memory-wise, her house-created husband comes home. Another beautifully creepy moment as he sees her tied to a chair, barely reacts. Just sort of like keeps smiling, turns to Dylan, and Dylan's like, don't move. And he just walks over to him and bats the gun out of his hand. All of that was amazing. And then she, again, Dylan being her nightmare, right? She sees the man that she thinks and has thought for however long was her husband killed by this crazy home invader who keeps insisting that he's her husband. What? I I, I just, I'm... I'm all about that. I'm all about the, just the, the pathetic irony of everything here. <sighs> Margot and Seth go off on their own looking for the border. All right, we have some beautiful kind of, I would say very simple effects, but still uh, effective where you see this, uh, it looks like an ink dipping into water, right? Uh, you know, sometimes if you, if you drop like a, a color into water, it like sort of diffuses. That's what the sky looks like close to the edge of the no end house. And Margot and Seth go walking along. Seth tells a little bit Margot about foster families. I personally, this is this is 100% Albert here, but I got annoyed at this scene because it's such a cliche in movies and television for the foster family to be like. Oh man, I have a bad past. I had foster families. I was in the foster system, you guys. It sucked and it was the worst. And I've been a foster parent. I've sat in the room where other foster parents were training to be foster parents. And those are like, at least 90% of them that I saw were good people who wanted to help kids. And I mean, I say 90%, I don't actually... I can't see inside their hearts, you guys. But it seemed like everybody was there, not because they were going to get anything out of it, but just because they wanted to help some kids. And maybe we should stop dumping on the foster parent system, is what I'm saying. Movies and TV. Maybe people are trying the best they can. Anyway, they, they go to find the border of the world. Alpha JD goes to Jules and tells him that Margot and Seth went out. And he seems to be getting agitated, right? Because he doesn't have anything to feed on now. He's killed his double. So, and the interesting thing here is too, after this JD double killed his real counterpart, he slips away from being that alpha male, sort of very confident guy into much more of the role that the original JD played. Where now he's sort of, unconfident he's not a leader by any stretch of the imagination he's nervous he's taken this action to kill his real person double but now he has no memories to feed on and that's 
that you can tell that it's getting to him and he's, he's starting to be worried. He wants to get out of the house. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention also father thing when he was chasing Margo kills a dude with the garden hose and that was boss. And the dude he kills with the garden hose again, I, this is just, this is a jump back because it was a beautiful moment of gore. However, you have this moment where the house is not all working together. Either the person that he killed and this guy's wife are agents of the house somehow. That, and and that, there's some evidence of that, right? Because Margot, when she goes and talks to him momentarily, he's sort of incoherent. He, he, it's not like he's completely like babbling, but he's not really interacting with her. But when the father thing kills him with the sprinkler, then like the reaction of the wife is pretty horrific. And you'd think, again, the house does not work together. If these things are creations of the house, they're not working with the father thing to ensnare Margot. And if we're going back to the idea that there's some kind of physical reality to the house, I'm getting further and further away from just chalking everything up to dream logic. Uh, that there is some kind of created thing here so uh, that that all like ties in with some of the stuff we've been talking about already the gang all finally gets back together and they see Margot's dad coming after him all right still looking it's getting to be nighttime now Jules Margot sees Jules down on the road and goes to sort of rescue her and they all end up running into this house where there's this hole in the floor and Jules has this great standoff with her dad where she talks to him about what did it feel like to die and she wanted details earlier in the episode too and he got he was pretty sketchy he just said yeah you know it wasn't it wasn't that bad there wasn't a lot of pain and here he tries a different tactic here right here he plays up the agony i think because he's looking for some sympathy at this point and he says oh yeah no i I, I realized afterwards that I shouldn't have done it and I could feel everything closing in on me. There's the moment from earlier that she had talked about where she said she talked about being choked to death by your own face. And that was just beautifully creepy. And I, I think that at this point, the father thing is taking from what Jules's memories were and what she told him even and saying, oh no, it was awful, actually, I lied earlier, but now, for real, the truth, it was bad, and you should feel bad for me. Jules, at this point, realizes what this thing is, that it is a created memory, or it's created from her memories anyway, that it doesn't know anything that she doesn't know, and that it's only cobbling these pieces together because it has an inside track on her mind and knows what's going to affect her. And she lets him fall into this trap, this hole that they have covered up in the floor. Apparently he gets killed. I, it seems unlikely that this is the last we're going to see of John Carroll Lynch, but we don't, I, I, we didn't see really what becomes of him. He's just down in this dark hole and I'm hoping that he comes back, but like kind of messed up now in the next episode. That's my, that's, that's what my dream is messed up like al already a monster but now sort of a monster on the outside because they've broken him and pieces of his face are coming apart and he's need that's what I'm hoping for um <clears throat> they meet up with backpack guy he gives him a little more insight into what's going on tells him about his wife and how that the house is eating your, their memories Margo and Seth get it on and I, I saw a lot of interesting uh, thoughts about this. People weren't super happy with this scene. I, my perspective on it wasn't so much about, and I get the question of, does this make sense in character for her? Because she's, you know, she's inside a horror house. Like her dad is a fake thing made out of memories. Maybe now is not the best time to have sex. But from my perspective, the beautiful thing about this scene is the way it was intercut with Jules and the womb thing, okay? The egg, so to speak, as she goes, and I forgot to mention that they had covered this earlier, but when Jules and Seth are talking about foster families, he mentions, I'm sorry, not Jules, uh, Margot and Seth are talking about foster families. <clears throat> he mentions 
that you can choose to forget bad things in your life. And that idea appeals to Jules, right? Because she has some things that she wants to forget. And we don't know what those, we know what that is in Margot's case, right? Margot has things she wants to forget, but she's clearly not willing to give those up yet. Jules is going through something and we haven't got a lot of clues to it. We have the, the scene in the beginning of episode two where she's just crying in the car for apparently no reason. And some people have theorized that maybe her sister has died, had died at some point, maybe recently. Maybe that's why her mom is smoking weed, trying to sort of forget all about that. I don't know, okay? But whatever the case is, Jules decides to give her memories to the egg. And that is just from a character point of view, a character deciding to do something that's really intense. And the fact that it's intercut with Margot and Seth having sex and the idea that for Jules, the giving up this memory, getting this out of her head is pure bliss in the same way that sex is pure bliss and release for Margot here. I, I thought that worked really, really well. It may be poor judgment on Margot's part, but I mean, people just do stupid things sometimes. I don't think that's a plot hole or a character flaw so much as it is just Jules gets a right to be irrational every once in a while. Everybody does, okay? Not everybody acts in the most rational possible way. I'm going to write Jules a pass for this one, you guys. And then we get the reveal. I alluded to this already, but Seth finds JD picking at the skin that's coming apart off of his arms and he says, oh, you're coming apart already? And we get this reveal that Seth, the guy who Margot was just left with, is a pod person, for lack of better terminology at this point. Um, and he goes back and lays down with Margot and has the creep, like just the most beautiful creepy stare on his face. He doesn't need to shut his eyes or anything. I, My question here is, so we see... We know what happened to JD, right? We saw JD meet up with his doppelganger and his doppelganger killed him. The, G the Seth that we saw in the previous episode, the one who encountered the family in the cage, did not seem to be, and this is completely speculation on my part, but he did not seem to be a pod person. He was reacting to these in a very, these things in a very realistic human way. So something must have happened to real Seth at some point. I don't know what it is. I don't know if he's still out there and he's going to show up at some point, or if we're going to see how this Seth killed that person or somebody, and this, I really have fun with this theory. Somebody suggested that possibly the previous iteration of their lives was actually also in the no end house and they just didn't realize it and he's a creation of the no end house from that iteration from Jules somehow I'm sorry not from Jules from Margot I am very sorry I, I know I've mixed those names up several times in this episode but it's hard to keep them straight but that is I, I don't know it's an interesting mystery and it, uh, this this show keeps on giving us interesting things and keeps us wondering that's what I love about it the first episode was I thought really solid with the scariness and the horror, and they have not matched that yet. But the new concepts and the way they're twisting things around, especially in this episode, uh, even more than the first episode, I think the first episode was a lot of setup, and here we are getting into some of the meat, and the way they're evolving this story has just got me tickled pink. I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. If you are or are not, uh, leave a comment. Let me know about it. If I've forgotten something or if you have a theory that's different than what I've said, let me know also in the comments. And I will see you guys next week with another episode of the Channel Zero No End House a Recap. Take care, guys.